So we begin this next unit, Unit 9, uh, by picking up our story with the Peace of Nicias, which had been established in 421 after the Spartans had experienced a severe reversal at the Pylos campaign in which a couple of hundred Spartans surrendered and were taken prisoner by the Athenians. Uh, these prisoners were brought back to Athens and used as bargaining chips to get the best possible terms from the Spartans during the peace negotiations that dragged on for years. Now, the Spartans will counter with a brilliant campaign led by one of their great commanders, Brasidas. He will campaign in the north. He'll capture the Athenian-controlled city of Amphipolis and will basically stabilize the situation for the Spartans and ultimately force the Athenians to sit down at the negotiating table and out of this sequence of events comes the Peace of Nicias, which was actually supposed to be a 50-year treaty. Now, as we move through Thucydides' Book 5, we are introduced to a character who will be by far the most intriguing figure of the Peloponnesian War, and that is the Athenian Aristoi Alcibiades. In the year 420, he first appears in Thucydides' history. He's about 30 years old. So he's a relatively young man, and all the ancient sources indicate to us that he was fantastically good-looking and equally charismatic. He was a great public speaker. He was audacious, bold, and dynamic. And in a way, he was the living embodiment of everything that Athens aspired to be. So in uh, 420, he is elected as one of the uh, ten uh, strategoi, one of those ten generals, and immediately, uh, I guess the ink on the peace treaty wasn't even dry, uh, Alcibiades immediately, uh, upon assuming a position of authority, will call for a renewal of war. And, you know, there's a lot of speculation as to the inner psychology of what drove Alcibiades, and the consensus seems to be that this guy was just ambitious beyond all belief. He knew that he was gifted and talented, and he wanted to maximize his status within the Athenian polis. His father had been killed in battle when uh, Alcibiades was a young boy, and Alcibiades and his younger brother were then brought into the home of Pericles to be raised, so Pericles became his guardian. And you have to wonder at the psychological impact of growing up in the house of the greatest man in Athens and what kind of effect that would have had on Alcibiades. It certainly may have fueled his ambition to be every good, every bit as good as Pericles, and even better. And, you know, you can't achieve greatness, or kleos, if your city is at peace. So we can imagine that Alcibiades must have been frustrated that just at the moment where he would reach a position of military authority, peace would break out. So he did as much as he could to undermine the peace of Nicias, first by attempting to create an alliance of Peloponnesian states that were opposed to Sparta, especially uh, the Peloponnesian uh, polis of Argos, which had traditionally been Sparta's great rival for dominance uh, of the Peloponnese. So Athens and Argos are going to be the two key players in this anti-Spartan alliance, but despite the best efforts of Alcibiades, a broader war will not break out. We get some low-key battles, uh, but not enough uh, to tip the Spartans into um, uh, resumption of hostilities. Now, in 416, an opportunity arises for a foreign adventure when a delegation from the Sicilian town of Egesta went to Athens to request assistance in a conflict with its southern neighbor, Salinas. Now, here on my map of uh, Sicily, uh, you will see the location of these two city-states, uh, Agesta in the north, Salinas just below that. Now, I should point out and remind you guys that the island of Sicily and the region of southern Italy were known as Magna Graecia, or Greater Greece. And this refers to the fact that centuries earlier, colonies, Greek colonies, had been founded on Sicily and southern Italy, and they had become very prosperous. Uh, 
But they still maintained strong cultural connections to uh, the homeland of Greece. So the dynamics of Sicilian geopolitics are now going to insert themselves into Athenian domestic politics when these representatives from Egesta arrive and uh, they ask for Athenian military support. And right away, Alcibiades recognizes an opportunity. So he immediately puts forth a plan by which Athens will send a military force to Sicily. And this decision sets the stage for what will be covered in books six and seven of Thucydides' history. And this is an episode commonly referred to as the Sicilian expedition phase of the war. Now, Alcibiades has a very specific plan, and that is to take control of the main polis, the main city-state on the island of Sicily, a place called Syracuse. And this is because technically Syracuse was allied with this um, Salinas, this uh, smaller city-state that the Egestans wanted help against. So Alcibiades is already building into his strategic equation this idea that we will have to take on Syracuse, the main city-state on the island of Sicily. And uh, we see uh, a question arise. We have to ask ourselves why the Athenians would want to mount an expedition a couple of hundred miles to the west of Greece when we have this very tenuous peace treaty just barely holding in Greece. And the short answer is that there is no real compelling strategic reason why Athens needs to send forces to hammer on Syracuse. But Alcibiades is going to be the driver of events here. And he senses this opportunity not only to get out there on the battlefield and show everybody what a great commander he can be, but he knows that if the Athenians are able to take control of Syracuse, it was a very wealthy polis, they can add significantly to their empire. Now, it's at this point where I should remind you about what Pericles had said in the opening phases of this war uh, way back in 431. He said to the Athenian people, you know, we're going to be okay as long as we don't try to expand our empire. We should focus all of our resources on defending what we have while this conflict is ongoing. As long as we don't try to expand in a dramatic fashion, we should be okay, and it is just this sort of expansion that Alcibiades is now proposing. So we might imagine that Pericles would probably be spinning in his grave as this plan was being debated in the Athenian assembly. Now, the reason given for connecting Syracuse with this war is that Syracuse was a colony founded by Dorians from the Peloponnese. And the Spartans, as you may remember, were also of a Dorian uh, ethnic background. So there was this you know, common cultural link. And there was the possibility that Syracuse could supply Sparta with either military aid or with grain, especially if ever a Helot revolt uh, broke out and disrupted the Spartan food supply. So Syracuse is depicted as Sparta's plan B food supply, uh, should there be a resumption of hostilities. And that's the kind of strategic rationale that Alcibiades, in part, puts forth. And it, you can tell it's rather convoluted and tenuous. Now, Thucydides points out that when the initial delegation from Agesta approached the Athenians, the Athenians sent back uh, a, their own delegation back to Sicily uh, to uh, check out the situation. And uh, the Egestans pull kind of a scam on this Athenian uh, delegation by convincing the Athenians that Egesta has lots of money, has lots of wealth, because the Egestans had even uh, offered to pay for the entire expedition if only the Athenians would agree to sending their military forces. And uh, we begin to see uh, this uh, motive now developing uh, within uh, the Athenian assembly that, you know, if these people are rich, uh, we can grow rich at their expense. We can hammer on somebody who maybe we will be able to conquer, you know, the Syracusans and take them over, and then we'll be richer still. 
So uh, Thucydides really emphasizes a material motive that begins to drive events, this idea of wealth uh, for all the Athenians involved. Now, Nicias, who had negotiated the peace of Nicias, he strongly opposes this plan. Uh, I do want you guys to read some of these speeches in the reading assignment, the Thucydides reading assignment, to note the points put forth. Um, Alcibiades, he will get the better of the debate, and when it looks as if he is going to have his plan approved, Nicias, in a fit of desperation, decides to speak one more time, and he points out that, look, there's a lot of uncertainty here. We don't know what kind of resistance we're going to meet, and you've only got a couple of dozen triremes slotted for this expedition. I think we need something much larger. And the Athenian assembly ultimately approves the deployment of over a hundred triremes for the Sicilian expedition. And that is a significant chunk of Athenian overall military assets. So Nicias's last ditch attempt at reverse psychology backfires badly on him and on Athens, because if anything goes wrong with this expedition, the Athenians really have put all their eggs in one basket. Now, to make matters worse, the Athenian assembly decides that joint command of this expedition will go to Nicias and Alcibiades. And to keep these two guys from killing one another, they're going to insert a third co-commander, a professional soldier named Lamachus. And so you have a three-way split as far as command goes, and two of the commanders hate each other's guts. So, you know, it's under these circumstances that the fleet is assembled and preparations are made for a very, very large military venture into relatively unknown waters. Now, to make matters worse and even more dismal, right before the fleet sails, an act of sacrilege occurs throughout Athens. Uh, throughout the city, you have these statues called the Herme, okay? And they were religious statues, and they were in part uh, shrines to the god Hermes, who, as many of you probably know, is, amongst other things, the messenger god, a god of travels. And, you know, the Athenians were pious people, so when this uh, vandalism, basically these statues are uh, uh, knocked over, toppled over, are broken, uh, when the Athenian people wake up to this act of uh, vandalism, they are horrified because uh, we have this... Uh, you know, uh, affront this insult to the god of travels right before a major Athenian military expedition that's going to have to travel by sea. So a kind of uh, you know, frantic witch hunt uh, environment develops, and um, there is a uh, real need to find out who did this and punish these uh, people before uh, the wrath of the gods falls on the head of all Athenians. Now, suspicion falls onto Alcibiades because he lived a very flamboyant lifestyle. And he was known for throwing these uh, symposia, these wild drinking parties. And a couple of times these things had gotten out of control and there was a report that Alcibiades and some of his uh, drinking buddies had made fun of and had profaned the Eleusinian Mysteries. Uh, which was a very, very reverent ceremony. So Alcibiades falls under suspicion for this uh, latest act of a sacrilege. Now, was Alcibiades responsible for this sacrilege? I mean, he had a lot riding on the Sicilian expedition, and he knew that public opinion was relatively divided. I just don't know if he would do anything that stupid to jeopardize the fleet setting sail because uh, you certainly, you know, don't want to anger the gods or, you know, uh, or upset very pious Athenian population. Now, certainly there were a lot of Athenians who were adamantly opposed to the Sicilian expedition. Uh, Nicias did have a uh, strong support uh, amongst uh, generally the older men. And maybe, uh, you know, s something like a sabotage occurred to prevent the fleet from setting sail by inserting this uh, uncertainty of religious sacrilege into the mix. Now, the end result is going to be that Alcibiades will be accused, 
And initially, he wants to have a trial right away, while his supporters are all still in Athens. They haven't set sail yet, and they could serve on juries, and maybe they would be sympathetic to him. But his political opponents decide to let the fleet and Alcibiades uh, set sail with the understanding that when things are ready for the trial, a ship will be sent to get Alcibiades, bring him back to Athens so he can stand trial, and uh, likely be found guilty. So Alcibiades knows right away that they're setting him up and that the jury will likely be stacked against him. And ultimately, um, not Long into uh, operations uh, in Sicily, uh, Alcibiades does make it that far, but he decides that the time is right for him to leave. And so he does. He flees, and he flees, of all p- places, uh, to Sparta. He seems to have been really angry at what he perceives as a betrayal by the Athenians and uh, makes a commitment to do all he can to damage Athens. So he begins to advise the Spartans as to how best to counter not only the Sicilian expedition, but he gives them some very wise strategic advice as to how to cripple Athens in Greece itself. So we are now set for an epic disaster as the fleet uh, does arrive in Italy. You see the trip here, and uh, we see that uh, Syracuse is going to be the main target, and Syracuse itself is going to be an urban area, and it will be flanked by the great harbor of Syracuse. And with Alcibiades fleeing to Sparta, he uh, immediately begins to look at ways by which the Spartans can directly support Syracuse uh, when the Athenians attack. And you see here a timeline that 4.15 is when the Athenians will send the ships, and shortly thereafter, Alcibiades is going to flee and begin advising the Spartans. And the Spartans will put together a relatively small force to aid Syracuse. Now, in this case, it is quality over quantity, because the commander of this Spartan force, um, sent to help the Syracusans, is going to be a commander of some brilliance, a Spartan named Gylippus. And he is, turns out to be extraordinarily effective at turning the Syracusans into a formidable fighting force. So now, with Alcibiades gone, and I should mention the other co-commander, Lamachus, is killed in an early battle um, outside of uh, the walls of Syracuse, So now we have nobody but Nicias left in charge. And again, we have to remember that Nicias, who is an older man, he is in his 50s, late 50s, and he never wanted to be there in the first place. And as time goes by, uh, Thucydides tells us that he grows ill with kidney stones. And, uh, you know, he was never a very dynamic commander. So... This inertia that begins to grip the Athenian force, they just kind of hang out waiting for something to do. And this strategic inertia uh, gives uh, the Spartan uh, Gylippus and the Syracusans an opportunity to organize themselves and mount a a pretty uh, effective defense. Now, in early 414, the situation has become rather stagnant outside the walls of Syracuse. And Nicias decides he's going to write the Athenian assembly requesting further instructions. Basically, should he stay and continue the siege of the city, or should he pull out? Now, the Athenian assembly has to make another crucial decision, and they basically decide to double down on their initial bet, and they send a rather substantial force to Sicily to reinforce Nicias. This reinforcement group is led by the general uh, Demosthenes, and we met Demosthenes earlier in uh, Thucydides' history. He is the Athenian commander who basically forced the Spartan surrender on that small island of Sphacteria during the Pylos campaign. So Demosthenes was known as an innovative commander, willing to think outside the box, and that's exactly what the Athenians need at this point during the Sicilian campaign. Now, when Demosthenes and his reinforcement group arrive, he's shocked at how bad the situation has gotten for the Athenians. 
He thought that they'd be in a much better position, but they haven't really made too many inroads at all towards a successful conclusion. And he has decided that there are two options, to either pull out and head back home or try something extraordinarily daring. So he runs a rather daring idea by Nicias, who does not want to go back to Athens a failure. Uh, you guys should recognize that the Athenian assembly was notorious for punishing failed commanders. Uh, think of Thucydides himself, who was exiled in 424 for failing to hold on to Amphipolis when the Spartan commander Brasidas took it. So the decision is made to try something very risky, and that is a night attack on the Epipoli, this patch of high ground overlooking Syracuse. If the Athenians were able to capture that, they'd be in a very strong position to flank the city. So a night attack is launched by Demosthenes, and here we get a case of a daring commander who probably just pushes things too far. Because night attacks were the most risky operations you could have in the ancient world. Nowadays, with night vision equipment, it's doable. But back in the day, it certainly was not. To make a long story short, the Athenian force and their Sicilian allies get up onto the high ground, the Epipoli, but in the night, uh, Athens' Sicilian allies, who spoke a Dorian dialect, uh, they begin communicating with one another, and the Athenians thought that these allies were actually Syracusans coming to counterattack them. So we have a situation where, uh, sort of like friendly fire, where the two groups who are on the same side begin fighting one another uh, in the dark of the night. And uh, this alerts the Syracusans that their position is about to be attacked, and they attack this already confused Athenian force, and the entire attack falls apart with uh, very heavy casualties on the Athenian side. After this disaster, uh, the decision is made by both Nicias and Demosthenes that uh, the Athenians need to pull out and go home. But then Thucydides describes a series of delays that occur. I mean, in one case, uh, there is a lunar eclipse, and this convinces Nicias that he needs to hang in there for another 27 days. Um, he had his... Uh, priest tell him what this lunar eclipse meant, and the priest indicates you've got to stay for uh, another 27 days. And so all this time, while the Athenians are kind of hanging around waiting to go home uh, and getting weaker, the Syracusans are getting stronger. And when finally the decision is made by the Athenians, time to go, the Syracusans have been able to gather a significant naval force and have blockaded the Athenian fleet within the great harbor of Syracuse. So the Athenians, they lose a naval battle uh, because they just can't get out of the harbor, and they attempt an overland retreat through some very marshy area, and that uh, force is caught and destroyed by uh, Syracusan hoplites and cavalry. And any prisoners that are taken, any Athenian prisoners that are taken, are sentenced basically to languish as slave labor in the rock quarries of Sicily where they die a slow and miserable death. Both Nicias and Demosthenes are killed in this operation, and the destruction of the Athenians in Sicily marks something of a major turning point in this conflict. And we must remember that none of this had to happen. This is the work of one man, Alcibiades, who came up with a plan, drove it through the Athenian assembly, got it approved, and then, of course, with the sacrilege incident, will ultimately flee to Sparta and help them out, and the Athenians are going to suffer a strategic setback of historic proportions. The war will continue to go on, though, and I'm leaving you now with the end of Book 7 in the year 413, and Thucydides' history will go on until the year 411, when it abruptly breaks off, and then I'm going to include some additional sourcing to get us down to the completion of the conflict in 404, when Athens, despite this Sicilian disaster, is actually able to hang in there for about nine more years, fighting on until 404, when finally 
it is ultimately exhausted and defeated by the Spartans. 